We keep things rolling here on the Sports Cubicle. I'm your host, Mike Mercado. I am here with Paul Shivari, and it has been an episode where there has been a lot of news that is taking place in the court that impacts things that are happening on the field, and this is something else that has hit the news wire, and Paulie, I think you and I have been really interested in this. It is something that we've been covering here on the Sports Cubicle, and this is just another chapter into what is happening in this entire story. So to catch up, anybody who is new to the program or just needs a quick refresher to what's going on. This comes to us from Adam Luckett over at Kentucky Sports Radio, KSR. What you need to know about House versus NCAA settlement. On Wednesday, the NCAA Board of Governors voted to accept a settlement offer in the House versus NCAA NC Trust case. That became even more official on Thursday when the SEC and Pac-12 voted to do the same. A new age in college athletics can be arriving in 2025. So what exactly is House versus NCAA? In its simplest form, House v. NCAA is an antitrust lawsuit filed against the NCAA brought by former Arizona State swimmer Grant House in 2020. The suit challenges the NCAA's NIL, name, image, and likeness rules, former TCU women's basketball player Sedona Prince and Illinois football player Tamir Oliver have joined the case as well. Being tried in the North District of California, the NCAA can be forced to pay damages to over 14,000 NCAA current and former athletes for what they could have made if NIL was allowed before 2021. So I think this is really important, Paul, to point out really fast. Why did the NCAA want to settle? The NCAA and its members' conferences were going to be forced to pay over $4 billion in damages in retroactive NIL pay if they were to lose this case. And losing seems likely at the moment. Part of the damages would include shares of broadcast revenue. Reaching a settlement means $2.8 $2.8 billion in back pay to NCAA athletes over a 10-year period. Had a settlement not been reached, the back pay could have soared way past that $4 billion figure due to several antitrust lawsuits currently ongoing against the NCAA. The power conferences will pay 40% of the back pay due, and the remaining 60% will come from conferences outside the Power 5. Check out the entire article over at Kentucky Sports Radio KSR by Adam Luckett. What you need to know about House v. NCAA settlement. A great breakdown if this is your first time jumping into this news story. Papali, an interesting revelation in the story that we've been covering over the last few months. We've had great guests about this, but your thoughts after you've read this article, you saw this update on this really interesting case, this interesting change in the landscape that is college athletics. So I, I'm not smart enough to know the big picture on this, and I know we've talked to Professor Michael Leroy, who we want to have on again to talk about this, but This is one of several lawsuits right now, but this is big that it got settled with the amount of money that we're talking about here. And I think they were talking about broadcasting shares, you know, for the future to kind of pay for some things. I don't know what other things this will create. You know, will there be athletes beyond the 10 year period that will want their, you know, fair share of back pay going, you know, all the way back. But, you know, everyone's saying that this shatters the amateur model, which I think we've been trending in that direction anyway. So so I don't know if it's like, is this the big deal that we're trying to make this out to be? Or has that already happened once NIL was created? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it's huge regardless for the overall fight. But we still have Johnson versus the NCAA. Uh, In Colorado, there's Fontenot versus the NCAA. Um you know, and they're even asking to combine the Fontenot case with Carter versus the NCAA, which is being heard in the Northern District. You know, so I mean, there's so many different things, and I think ultimately it's trying to say the same thing that basically, you know, players do have the right to make money. They were limited in opportunities where they were supposed to make money, whether it was like their personal likenesses or or their property, that sort of thing. You know, whereas, and I think Johnson is supposed to determine, are these actual employees? So I think that's the next step too. You know, it blows away the amateurism model. Now these people are making money with the universities, but then it creates, you know, what, what are the new questions? And Johnson versus the NCAA is going to answer, you know, are they technically employees? Which we saw the, you know, the Dartmouth men's basketball team unionized, you know, and then we, we saw, you know, 10 years ago, Northwestern football players tried to, tried to unionize. So I think it's it's another chapter in, I think, an overall huge story. But, I mean, it's huge. 
um, we'll see where it goes from there, but um, we'll see how this affects other things. I think my big opinion on this entire thing is not necessarily what's going to happen in the court and people who have way more knowledge in this and people who literally have degrees and get paid a lot of money to handle these type of things. But I think for the everyday sports fan, the everyday person that talks about these things around the table, around the barbecue, in the barbershop, I think if we all need to come down to one agreement, if we agree, if the country agrees that we're just going to be a, a capitalistic machine, that it's about get yours, get as much as you can, get that bread, be about that life, then I don't want to be a hindrance. I don't want to be a block towards these college kids being able to make money. So if you have a star like Arch Manning in Texas, if he's able to make $2 million, who is anybody to prevent him from making it? That is the whole point of this entire thing. I don't want to, if you don't want anybody being in your pockets, if you don't want anybody to tell you what you can make, what you think you're worth, don't tell anybody else they can in this country. That's where I always take away about this conversation from the fan outside perspective, from us, you know, everyday dum-dums that aren't going to be in courthouses handling these things. You know what I mean? When this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. But any final thoughts, Paul? I know we're going to do our best to make sure we actually get really smart people for our awesome audience on the Sports Cubicle to break this down for us. But any final thoughts about where we're at right now after hearing this story? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think what earlier this week we saw some previews of what NCAA football 25 is going to look like. And now we're talking about a video game here, but everyone was happy to see that there's last names on, on the jerseys. I was hyped. It's, I mean, it, you know, I, I think... You know, whether you like the game or not, it was always kind of fun, you know, because you, you knew who the players are modeled yeah. after. There was yeah. there was no yeah. way around that, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, you think of the the ones that have made such an impact on the game at their moment, like Michael Vick. You wanted to be Michael Vick on Virginia Tech, you know, back in the day playing the game. Well, now it would have his name on the back of the jersey. And it makes me wonder, too, with uh, bringing back guys from the past, you know, like the, the Tim Tebow's and the Michael Vick's and the guys that were, you know, the, the Charles Woodson's that were great back in the day. Will they have those retro teams back in the game that, you know, now you can play them and, you know, and then you can kind of back pay some of those athletes that didn't get the opportunities back in the day that these current athletes do. Looking more into the the house thing, it's it's just specifically athletes from 2016 mm-hmm. or 20, 2012, I think, to 2016. So it's so it's it's such a small sample size that, you know, I think we're going to see more and more the the class action suit for the athletes, you know, before the 2010s or, you know, the athletes that were kind of covered in between 2016 and 2021 when the NCAA allowed NIL. And then I think hopefully in the next decade, we'll see a better model for, you know, these athletes and how they're going to get their money. And and I think from what I understand that there's going to be kind of a pool that the power conferences put in that, you know, that uh, people can reach in. And then, and then after that, I think it's going to be the equality issue. You know, yes, football and basketball players are drawing more and making more money, but you know, how does that help the swimmers and, you know, the people that are like trying to pursue actual doctorates while still, you know, actually going to school for school and learning while still competing in, in their their schools, you know, representing their school. And you got to think the dynamics have changed over the years of having this conversation, because I would argue and I think a lot of people would argue women's college basketball is more of a revenue generating sport right now mm-hmm. than its men's counterpart. So they might be asking and we may we have to see the numbers more as they change. Probably with- not. But I think it's worked its way into the big three. Perhaps. I think we know football and basketball for the men's was always the big two. I, I yes. would venture to guess that women's college basketball has entered the arena into to, this is this is a popular enough sport where it is drawing a lot of water away from some of the smaller sports that we don't watch. I would even argue, and I, you know, may, however many the analytics may show, the simple fact that more people knew, more households, more common fans knew stars in the women's bracket than they did on the men's bracket. Yeah, shows to kind of set the trend. Now it's only it may just be a trend or it's the trend right now. But point being, point being, now it's a real conversation of where are you going to split the money? Caitlin Clark would have made Angel Reese, uh, Carmilla Card. Cardoso, uh, Juju, all these different players would have made more money than their men counterparts if it came down to who was more popular, who drove more Instagram stuff, mm-hmm. who drove more social media stuff. This is all new. This is all new info that we're going to have to take in this conversation. This is why every time we bring it up, it seems like there's some new tidal wave that's going on. There's this new revelation because it's ever changing every single time something that comes up. But I'm fascinated by this. and I, I can't wait to talk to somebody who's obviously just makes us dumb dumbs sound so much yeah, smarter. Someone that actually like, dedicates their lives to, to studying this sort of yeah. stuff. Because I'd, I'd also like to see, too, you know, did, did women's college basketball gain popularity as a direct result of the NIL? Because now, now we did know 
Caitlin Clark. We're seeing her in State Farm commercials. You know, did that? Did you know? Is, is there a mutual correlation there? That's that's what I want to know because we. I mean, women's college basketball has kind of been growing in popularity since you know before NIL. But I'm wondering if NIL just kind of helped it give it that that boost into the success that we're seeing right now, like you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, we got Cameron Brink who's like doing things with the Kardashians and stuff on Instagram. It's like they are names now compared to. Do you know who's the number one pick in the NBA draft going to be this year? What, who? What? Exactly. So we want to know what your thoughts when we have this you interesting conversation <laughs> on the sports game. We'll go let us know we're all over the universe. We got more coming up next. He's Paul Girari. I'm Mike Mercado. We're here on the sports cubicle.